infinite complacency. People went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. So on this edition of Into the Fray, I have on with me Anna Manalo. It is so nice to have you on finally. I've, I've been waiting to, to talk to you for ITF for a long time. I've been aware of you and listening to you on other shows uh, prior to me even doing my, my show, to be honest with you. So you are a thrice published author, soon to be fourth. And today we will be chatting quite a bit about your first book, and that is Portal, A Lifetime of Experiences. But of course, we will touch a bit on all of them. That way folks know what they're they're in store for, should they hopefully want to purchase one of these and, and delve in. And Anna, you're not only a story collector, of course, but you're also a personal experiencer. And I would, of course, like to begin with that age-old first podcast icebreaker question, and that is, what got you started in the world of the paranormal? Hi, Shannon. I, I wanted to preface, to thank you for the opportunity to talk on your show. Um, I've been looking forward to actually talking to your show for a number of years. So here we are. I feel like I'm now uh, on New York Times list here uh, <laughs> since you're the premier podcaster. So I, I'm really happy to be on your show. Um, to answer your question without getting too long winded, um, I actually was born and raised in an area that had so much anomalous activity. Um, it, it was one of those things where I just happened to be in a neighborhood uh, that was actually built right after World War II. And it was on what we, they would call unblessed ground. Um, I was born and raised in the Philippines. And in that particular context, World War II was pretty violent. Uh, my grandparents purchased a, a home. Well, it wasn't a home at that time. Purchased a piece of land, uh, which happened to be uh, an area that was strewn with bones uh, of Japanese soldiers and people who were massacred. So I started my life basically living in a haunted household. Uh, and on top of that, I and, and this is something um, listeners probably have not heard before, and I'm going to break the ice by saying that the first book that I wrote was almost autobiographical. Um, there is in the first 24 chapters of Portal, Shannon, that you mentioned, um, a story of a couple uh, and a small child who at the time was probably a year old. Uh, I happen, and I will go publicly with this because, and this is a surprise, I wrote it in the third person, um, referring to the child as someone else's child. I'm actually the child. Oh my goodness. Uh, and I, yes. <laughs> so this is new. I was working uh, for a pretty conservative outfit, a public school. Uh, when I wrote that book, I was still actively working there. Uh, and I was concerned about how it was going to be received, um, you know, if they, they would eventually find out, because I was writing under a pen name at the time. Now I'm writing under my own name, and I recently retired. So no holds barred, I will say. Portal, the first 24 pages, was about my family. Um, and it involved a demonic infestation of epic proportions that 
took on a situation where my father eventually committed suicide. So that's how I began into the field of this type of phenomena amongst other phenomena. I think what it did was it opened my eyes that there was definitely other things out there uh, that are not just unexplained, but are just outright terrifying that impinge into our reality, uh, whether we like it or not. So those were the first few years of my introduction into this particular field. And then to move on, when I moved to Pennsylvania, I got involved with MUFON. You know, now that my eyes and ears are open, I'm now pretty receptive to all kinds of information about the unknown. My husband and I went over to a friend's place who had invited us for dinner. Uh, and during that time, he had a huge black binder on the coffee table. So after dinner, we ended up in the living room and there's this huge binder. And it was this simple, Shannon. I opened the binder and lo and behold, it had all these drawings of all these types of aliens that could be seen on the planet. So then I turned to Jim, that was his name, our host. And I said, Jim, what is this book? And he says, this is a manual by the Mutual UFO Network. I can't talk anymore. Um, and I am training to be an investigator. And, and Shannon, it just began that simply. When I got home, I looked up the website, I ordered the book, and I took the test after studying the book from cover to cover. And the next thing you know, I was one of the investigators here in southeastern Pennsylvania. Well, first, Anna, uh, I'm pretty blown away because... I mean, full disclosure, I haven't read every word of the first 24 of Portal. I just kind of, I skimmed through. I found some to, to chat about today. As you well know, I sent you the little list there. But to learn that is you, I know enough about the 24 pages that I'm just, I'm kind of shocked right now. Uh, and of course, I'm so sorry. Uh, I mean, that's a horrifying situation to go through. And I'm so sorry about what happened to your father. Yes. It, at the time, it was pretty tragic. And obviously, I was too young to really, you know, see what that meant. Mm -hmm. um, I was basically just a toddler, you know, in a crib. Uh, and apparently, there was something that could not be shaken. The Roman Catholic Church came in, all kinds of different people uh, from different faiths tried to intervene. You know, I talked at length about this in a couple of other podcasts uh, early on when Portal was first published. And I remember a conversation I had with a gentleman, Lon Strickler, uh, who is highly respected for the Mothman stuff that was going on in Chicago and all the other anomalies that were coming his way. And I remember we were trying to figure out whether that entity was a thought form, whether it was demonic, or whether it was something else that was of alien origin. But regardless of this, Shannon, um, you know, I concluded that whatever it was, was a very malignant entity. Whatever it came from or wherever it came from, it certainly wreaked havoc on the small family that was, you know, he, he was pretty much the father and then I was the only child. And in that context, in a very remote, small hamlet, it's no longer a hamlet, but a small hamlet where there was a building uh, comprised of six different apartment units. And these are townhouses up and down. The thing first materialized along this small river. There was, that was just yards away from the back of the townhouse. We have no idea what was there before. After he passed away, there was a lot of people who came in to research what was going on in the area before. And no one had cited this particular creature or entity or whatever it is previous to the haunting in the particular townhouse. 
So the only conjecture that I have, a conclusion I would say, is that it was a, a haunting of a human, if you know what I mean. It wasn't so much that the location was haunted. The townhouse was relatively new. I think it would have been built probably three or four years before my parents moved in. And there was really nothing there but wildlife. So it might have been something that followed him, perhaps. I don't know. So that's where I started. So you said earlier that to you and prior to talking to Lon, or maybe still you feel this way, I don't know, but let's just go off what you said in the beginning, that you felt like it was something demonic. It was a demonic infestation. And granted, you may not remember that time, but knowing, at least feeling the way that you do now about what that may have been, if that big black book on your host table wasn't a book of aliens, but was a, a big encyclopedia of demons and demonic activity, would you have been a little bit more reticent to, to dive in? And would you have been like, oh, wow, well, that's I'm not touching that because my family has already had experience in the demonic realm. So I don't need to mess with that. Gosh, that, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I, to tell you the truth, I don't think I would have. I probably would not have had the courage to become that closely involved. There's a lot of aspects with living in a haunted home. And then later on, after, you know, after having moved out of that townhouse, we were actually followed uh, three miles away to my grandmother's home. Uh, and things really took off. I don't know that I would ever want that type of attachment or infestation ever to be around me again. And I think that's where I stepped back. Uh, and to answer your question, when I saw it was about, you know, entities from another dimension or, you know, UFOs, it, I, I think I was eager to learn more about that. And later on, I realized there, there's an interplay between all those different forces. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in a multiverse. You know, when, when, you, when you see a Bigfoot sighting, sometimes it also is accompanied by a sighting of a UFO. There's also a malignant element to some of these alien sightings. You know, people getting abducted, uh, getting injuries, getting implants. It, I begin to think that maybe, perhaps, there is definitely a connection between all that phenomena. But that's just my opinion. No, I, I, I was actually going to bring up the very same thing. You know, as far as once you talk about demonic activity, and I, I mentioned the big black book, what if it was filled with, with demons instead of aliens, but some people believe they're one and the same. So, yes. One of the things that made me think that what we were looking at, or at least I was told that I had witnessed it looking through the window. Um, I'm not going to give too much away, um, you know, for anyone who's listening as to what was seen through the window. But what my mother had done when she finally saw the creature herself was walked over to the opposite wall. She grabbed a cross that was hanging there and she proceeded and, and she's very courageous to have done this. I mean, I, I really commend her for having had the courage and the foresight to be able to do this. My father was stooped and facing down towards the typewriter. He was a writer like myself. Uh, he couldn't look at the window. There was a steady low hum that seemed to be blunting any kind of background sound in this room. And when my mother entered, there was a sense of pervasive menace, a feeling of sadness. And when she looked at the window, she grabbed the cross from the wall and then proceeded towards it, towards the window. And the way it reacted, Shannon, kind of imbued in my mind 
that this creature was responding to a holy symbol because what it did was it folded one wing to cover its face and then it proceeded to effervesce. It kind of sank down off the window and started to vanish. Well, if if the mention of the wing alone doesn't get people to buy this to find out exactly what the whole thing looked like, I don't know what will because I'm sitting here going, oh my goodness. Plus, the the low hum that was heard is very interesting, right? Because uh, that's usually something that you hear directly in correlation with a UFO sighting. Occasionally. Sometimes they're just completely silent. Sometimes you hear about this low hum. Yes. I know that you travel. You travel a whole lot. You just got back. Uh, we were just talking before we started recording. You just got back stateside a couple of weeks ago. And I kind of went through portal as far as, well, gosh, I mean, Anna's got so many different stories collected from different places that you've been. I thought we'd just take a, a little tour. And then, of course, we can. And by the way, let me go ahead and mention here, guys. Uh, so, again, book one is what we're mostly going to be talking about on this edition. That is Portal, A Lifetime of Paranormal Experiences. Book two is The Way Through the Woods, A Child's Escape Through the Haunted Forests of World, World, also can't talk today, World War II Germany. And then book three was the most recently released, and that is Haunted Heirlooms. And book four is uh, soon to be, uh, in, in, in months coming, released as well. So if you guys, you know, need some good reads... Anna's got you covered there. So one of the places that stood out to me, or one of the stories, was one from Marrakesh. And this was a young woman who encountered something, it sounds like very, very dark, and would be probably on my no list. Yeah, this one um, really took me for a spin, because I wasn't a lot of these stories I, I don't expect. I don't go looking for them. And as I mentioned before, we, we travel a lot. Uh, I used to be a travel photographer when I was also working by day during the school year as a school counselor. You figured that out, but it made for very busy years. <laughs> and one of the things that I never expected was to be told stories. And, and I think, I don't know, maybe it's just the way I appear. Maybe I look receptive to people. Um, somehow people relax enough to know that they can share something like that with me. And I also share my own stories. I share my stories about things that happened to me, you know, in my childhood, just like I mentioned right now. It, it opens up conversation. And one of the uncanny conversations I had happened while I was actually, of all places, sitting on a stool, having some type of Arabic coffee or tea. I'm trying to remember whether it was tea or coffee. And it was with a date vendor, not, not the kind where you go out for a dinner and a movie, but dates as in the fruit. Mm -hmm. Morocco, it, it's supposed to be funny, haha. But anyway... <laughs> Um, I, I, I liked it. That, that's my kind of humor because people go, well, what yeah. did you mean? You know, what did you mean by that? It's, it, you got to point things out sometimes. It's okay. <laughs> so anyway, I'm having, I'm having a, a good time talking to a couple of people. Uh, some of them spoke English. Some of them spoke French. So between the two languages, we were able to, you know, trim it down to just sharing some stories the uh, vendor who was selling dates uh, told me that he has a college at the time, college age daughter, who had a very uncanny experience that still terrified her, gave her nightmares, and they still don't know how to explain it. Now, in the Arabic culture, these creatures that appear to be shapeshifters, uh, and you know, Shannon over in uh, Utah, they have a different name for them as well. But the shapeshifters uh, that we commonly refer to, they refer to as jinn. That's D as in dog, J-I-N-N. They are seen as very malevolent beings, entities. And in this particular instance, this poor girl happened to be exiting late at night, 
her last class at an alleyway of a very old university. It just happened to be one of the oldest, I think in the world, as a matter of fact, whose name escapes me, I should really Google it. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to take a picture of the alleyway and in that photograph at the very end of the hall of that alleyway, you'll see the door, which is the door, one of the doors to the university. I think it was past midnight. She was exiting after studying and she was walking down the alley. And Marrakesh is not well lighted at night. There are some interesting squares and streets that are lighted, but for the most part, the smaller, obscure alleys and little paths are not lighted as much. She recalled there was maybe one light at the end, and she was proceeding towards that just on her way to go home. So there she was, she was walking, and as she turned, she saw in the distance, just a few yards away, something that looked like a huge dog. But it was standing on two legs, and it looked like it had these pointed ears. But what was most frightening about it was the fact that it stood there with these glowing red eyes. And it exuded this very terrifying feeling that just made her shiver. So she knew that somehow it was waiting for her. She didn't really have a means of escape. She was alone at the time. So she quickly ran. She ran back down the alleyway towards the door that she had come out of. And it was almost like a nightmare, like she couldn't run fast enough. And she really hoped that the door at the end was open. And as she got closer to the door, thank goodness, another student had opened it to exit. And she turned around in time to see whatever this creature was that was pursuing her kind of go into a whirlwind of smoke is all that she could describe of it. It was just kind of like a small gray tornado. And then it was gone. Now, Anna, do you think that if someone from that country, say, say that young lady, let's take her for instance, she's perfect, she saw that over there. If she came to the U.S., and saw what we label as a dog man, do you think she would be surprised by the fact that there are some people that think that those are, that the dog man are flesh and blood? It's interesting because they really don't know what she saw. They have a very religious interpretation. She ended up going to some kind of uh, holy man to be prayed over. So I think her interpretation would not be to think that it was flesh and blood. And, and I know there's been dog man sightings and, and I think those are actually, I don't know, flesh and blood, kind of like Bigfoot. Yeah. This one, for some reason, the way she told me, it, it seemed like it was some kind of disembodied entity. Yeah, especially once it uh, disappears in a, a essentially a into smoke, right? I mean, how do you how do you parcel that out for straight flesh and blood? You kind of can't. But I think, um, yeah, I think that the whole with whatever you lend, whatever lens you're looking at things through is kind of what label ends up being put on things. But that part of it, I mean, I don't know how you would say, oh, that's a flesh and blood creature that just happens to be able to disappear into smoke. No, probably not. You also mentioned, though, that it had been spotted before. 
Yeah, and I think that that's why they ended up giving it a name. Because the experience of the people there is that these creatures are older than man, that they have been there. And so it's become part of their culture and their interpretation is that whatever it is, is almost like what the American Indians refer to as shapeshifters. What brings them up? I don't know. To me, and this is just my personal opinion. I think these things come out when there's some kind of negative event or devastation or something that's so violent and and they feed on the energy of that violence. It makes them manifest. In this particular case, though, I mean, not really knowing the girl and, um, you know, not having met her, but only having talked to the father. I got the impression that it was a pretty calm family otherwise, Mm. that there was really nothing that was going on that would bring it up or make it manifest. Yeah, that's a heck of a one-off sighting to have. You know, you got the red eyes, it's standing on two legs and growling at her, which does sound very much like a dog man. They don't seem to mind if you see them. They will come into more populated areas, sometimes than a Bigfoot, usually, you hear about doing. And then Mm -hmm. the fact that they kind of act a little bit aggressive. But again, I'm not trying to make these the exact same thing, but there are some parallels, except for that whole end part where it disappears into smoke. Yeah, yeah. And and you know what? I agree. I mean, the first impression I got was that the girl had encountered a dog man. And she was very lucky that it didn't attack her or, or do anything to her. Um, but I thought it was odd that once there was another person that came on the scene, that whatever it was chose to disappear. I do wonder, though, because, I mean, not that Bigfoot isn't fantastic and, and odd and, and we love talking about it, but Dogman, I think, is even stranger, right? And in and of itself, Dogman just seems like it should not be a thing, but it is. People are seeing it. I wonder, though, especially maybe over here in the States and with the you you well know as as much as I do how the communities can be. Right. And sometimes that that can be a loose term community. It can we can eat our own pretty well. I do wonder if someone saw a dog man and they had this horrifying sighting or maybe it wasn't horrifying. Maybe it was just a sighting. What if it did disappear into a puff of smoke? Would they even mention that? I I mean, because of the the backlash that may already come with having a dog man sighting and then to have it exit stage left in that in that way. I wonder if there's just things people are leaving out. I think so, too, because I mean, it's one thing. You know, you know how it is. You're having a conversation and then you start telling people, oh, did you see that creature? I remember locally over here, um, some people had seen a rake. And and to even owe up to having seen one, let alone say that it disappeared in a whirlwind, in a little tornado. I think people would start looking at you kind of funny (laughs) and start wondering, you know, are, are, are you on something? Right. You're like, oh, you're, you're imbibing a little bit too much. Yeah. So it, well, it's like the, yeah. the, the dog man's the, the cake and then the disappearing in such a manner would be the cherry on top. And you're like, nah, I don't know if I want the cherry right now. Let's just leave the cherry out of here. Cause it already sounds so fantastical, but yeah, that's just something I, I wondered after reading that. I'm like, well, it sounds so much like a dog man, but that in part, at least over here in the States, for the most part, we don't really hear that. So so this next one, the, the next subject, I should say, is one that fascinates me. And I would actually really like to see one of these. And you, this was over in France, which you visit France quite often, obviously. And this was a not dear story from uh, Bill and Myra. Yes. Uh, I, you know, Shannon, I'm glad you brought that up because um, that, that one I would... I would think is one of those things that have been seen before. 
And I remember as I was sitting there in the hotel, and it was just a hotel lobby. Um, I think we were in Romania, or maybe it was Budapest. I don't remember anymore. We had dinner with this couple, and they were a very friendly couple, very forthright. Uh, and this story came out after, you know, kind of like one of those fireside chats without the fire there, because it was the middle of summer. They traveled a lot. And before the escorted tour that they had taken w with us, and there was probably about 25 of us on this particular tour, they chose to go independently. And they rented a cottage uh, in the south of France. And, and, you know, France is about the size of Texas. So we're not talking about a really small, you know, country here. This happened to be a cottage that was situated on the southeastern, or I should say, southwestern corner of France, almost close to the border of Spain. That section is not often visited by tourists. Uh, usually, when you're coming towards the Mediterranean, you get a lot of people who, you know, visit the beach, visit the castles, and things of that nature. This was above Carcassonne. It's a little obscure village that they picked. And to make it worse and make it more remote, they rented a cottage that was probably about three or four miles outside of the village. So technically, they were in farmland in the middle of the woods. And you know what happens when you go kind of, I wouldn't say it's off the grid, uh, but certainly when you kind of go into a remote, lonelier area, these kinds of strange things happen more as if it's only for your own eyes to see and no one else's. They kind of wanted to get away from the kids and the grandkids. So they decided they would go ahead and book this on Airbnb. They got there. And they wanted to tour the area. They also wanted to go and, you know, drive around, which I did in this last visit. And they ended up going on some type of a tour, which kind of took them out of the way. So when they got back to the cottage, it was pretty late at night. And the husband recalled turning off all the lights and then turning on a porch light or two or some other internal light. But when they approached this house, all the lights were off except for some blue light. And Shannon, I can't explain the kind of blue. He was telling me he had never seen a shade of blue like this. It was a blue light that was so obvious inside the barn. There was a barn near the cottage, several yards away. It made it easier for him to locate where they were, you know, because he had to drive through a rocky path and park the car. So he parked the car and saw this huge blue light inside the barn and as if somebody had turned on huge light inside. And the first thing he thought of was, oh, maybe the landlord came to visit while we were gone and shut the lights off in the house. Maybe he's still in the barn. So they proceed inside. And they had a strange feeling somehow that there was something off, if you know what I mean something that was just unsettled. But they quickly, because of the lateness of the hour, they got very tired very quickly. They decided they'd go ahead, lock the door, get ready for bed. So they go up to the bedroom. And in the middle of the night, his wife gets up because the light in the barn is still on. And she looks out the window. She calls him over. The barn door was open. He looks through 
And then the next thing you know, they sense movement down below, just below them. Now, the house is two floors. The kitchen is right beneath their bedroom. And there is a window right beneath the window that they're standing on. And they see what they thought was deer, as in, you know, Bambi, full grown. So they're looking down at it and they're wondering, what what is it? And she said, it's deer. They've got deer. And he was just stupefied because he'd never seen deer standing on two legs. And he said, that can't be. So at this point, they've got a little bit of, you know, feeling really creeped out and edgy, wondering, what is it? Is it going to break in? What What is its intention? Why is it there? What's that blue light? And the blue light winks out. So they go downstairs. And they approach the kitchen window. The kitchen window is closed, but the shutters are open. In France, the shutters you can actually close. They're not just decorative. They're utilitarian. They had left all the shutters open, but the window glass is shut. And peering in were deer standing on its hind legs, looking in at them. I have no idea what it was. It wasn't moving. It was just, and he said there was probably two or three, probably three, just standing as a group, looking in. And needless to say, they were just terrified. So they tried to reach the landlord, found out the landlord had not been there. He had not shut off any lights. He has no idea what that light is that's in the barn. And the next day they left. They they went to a hotel in the nearby village. Yeah, you can't blame them for that, right? I think I'd be done with the cottage at that point, too. Yeah. So, Anna, how often have you heard of lights that will accompany a not deer sighting? Not often. I've heard of lights accompanying a Bigfoot sighting. Now, this one, I, I was at a loss. They were asking me for an explanation because I had volunteered that, you know, I had done some time as a MUFON investigator. And I said, I have no idea what you saw, but it looks to me like you might have undergone some kind of screen memory where maybe it was something else, but it disguised itself as deer to just make you more comfortable. But it wasn't, it wasn't like they had missed time. And, you know, in the UFO vernacular, they had no trace evidence, not that they would look for it. They probably didn't know to look for anything. Uh, she was feeling fine. He was feeling fine. There were no after effects. It was just that. Well, I don't know if this had come up at any point, but at any points in either of their lives, had they ever seen UFOs or strange lights in the sky? Don't think so. And these I don't so think they ever went back. So these not deer, uh, did they have all of their legs or were they just standing on the back too? They said that they didn't really see any front legs that they recall. Or if they had front legs, it was like by their side. And I said, well, deer don't stand that way. Right. I mean, you're if you're looking at deer and you're looking at hooves, you would have feet in front with hooves, but how would they stand? And why would they even stand that way? They can't. They're not capable of it. At least not that, you know, I'm no expert on deer, but I don't never heard of deer standing that way. And to be standing there and just staring in the window the way that they were. Yeah. And almost as if it was a group. It was like two or three of them just looking in, peering in. Mm. I take it back. In that case, I don't think I'd want to experience the not deer out in the middle of nowhere, woods, France. I don't, I think I'm okay on that. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it, it, it reminds me of, um, and, and I don't, I don't know. I, 
when I think back on that particular case, there was a case where, it, you know, here's another one that's closer here in Pennsylvania. It's it's probably about a seven, seven or eight mile drive. And it concerns a river. And on that, that river, there's a home whose backyard faces out onto the river. This is included in the book. There was a manifestation, a mound, a perfect mound of soil just showed up in this woman's backyard, just a few feet from the edge of the river. And something came out of it, something that was humanoid. And once again, you know, the person who was telling me this, who happened to be the brother, was stupefied, unable to explain what this creature was. His recall is that it didn't look anything like an animal, but it certainly looked like more like a shadow being. And once again, you get kind of that silence, you know, that kind of keen observing as if they're watching us or studying us. In this case, they were watching his sister, studying her. Well, that's a strange one. That reminds me almost of some uh, fey type stuff, you know, of of earth and water, that kind of a thing. I mean, it comes out of soil and it's 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 a mound that wasn't even there, and then it's right by a river. Yeah, almost like a, I guess they would call it um, like like a fairy, something like like an elemental. Ele yeah, yeah. Mm, that's. Yeah. Also very creepy. Uh, how do you did he say how tall the humanoid was? Was it shaped much like we would be? It, it was as tall as a man. It followed them because the gentleman who was telling me the story. It really creeped him out when it showed up at his sister's front door. It was originally standing by her French doors on the side of the house. It came from the backyard coming from this mound and things what what aggravated the sighting and made it follow him he thinks is because he kicked the mound mm. he was trying to figure out what it was and in the process he kicked it so he disrupted this perfect mound of earth and then he and his brother were going fishing and whatever it was followed them up to the Poconos as they were fishing on the edge of a stream. And he saw it there again. Yeah, that's some dark stuff. And then, you know, once you tick something like that off, I mean, how do you even begin to figure out how to get rid of it or put it back where it needs to go? Exactly. And he said that it was very uncanny because they were fishing and his brother had gutted some fish to dress it, to prepare it. And they threw the entrails of the fish right over the deck. The guy had like some kind of an A-frame, you know, house that was near that particular stream where they were staying. And when he got back to the sister's house to check in on how she was... He exited through the kitchen door and there was a small little patio right outside the kitchen door, which communicated to that same backyard. And the fish entrails that they had collected and thrown over the deck up in the Poconos ended up right there on the back stoop. Mm. No. Yeah. Oh, gosh, no. That was... Uh, 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 uh. Oh. Yeah. When he was telling me this, bear in mind, I'm local. I'm not talking about a different country <laughs> right. anymore or anything. <laughs> right. And it, it got to me because it was really just downright creepy, the fact that it was following them. And he wondered what his sister was doing that created that mound or whatever. And she said, no, I'm just gardening. And I just happened to notice it. And they thought first that it was some kind of like a, you know, one of those carpenter ant hills and things. I mean, this was a pretty big hill. 
You know, it was probably two or three feet high. So they concluded it was living there undisturbed until he kicked it. Oh, Betty, Betty won't do that again if he finds a mound. No. Poor guy. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's also on the no thanks list. Uh, yeah, once you see the the guts there, um, uh, hmm. nope. Well, Anna, I know that uh, on the list I had, you know, your 2009 UFO encounters and things. But how about for the last portion, you get you produce it. You you pick where we go next and what you would like to talk about. Maybe pick something from. Uh, way through the woods or haunted heirlooms whatever whatever you think and of course we'll plug all of that before we officially sign off but why don't you why don't you pick something for this last little bit here i i will say that um i i was pretty proud of the fact that i was able to put together haunted heirlooms that was a long time coming that is about four antique dealers that i have known through the years I originally am from Connecticut. When I lived in the Philippines, uh, my mother and I emigrated to the U.S. back in the 70s. And then I ended up going to college at a small, pretty small university in Connecticut. And I started traipsing about collecting small items. And, you know, when you're a student, you really can't afford much. Uh, And it started with a wing chair that I fell in love with at a flea market. Unbeknownst to me, it was not something that stood alone. There was something that was there that used to own it. And when I say that, it's, it's, uh, it's a ghost uh, of a woman. Uh, she appeared wearing flappers the whole bit as if she's going out on the town. It was not seen by me first. It was actually seen by college roommates because I bought the wing chair, not thinking I could afford it. But buy it, I did for $36. At the time, you know, it felt like a fortune to me. And I brought it back to take it to my dorm room and I plunked it there. So things went from there to getting the ministry of the school involved trying to figure out how to rid it of whatever it was that was showing up in the hallway. And eventually it actually tried to hurt someone. And then I did not give up on collecting antiques. I proceeded to visit different places and Haunted Heirlooms, which is the third book, uh, my latest one that was released this year, uh, is a conglomeration of all the haunted objects uh, that were experienced by four antique dealers in New England. So that, that to me, I think was finally put together. I finally put it together after all the years of holding on to their stories. Uh, Some of them have already retired. Some of them are actively still dealing in antiques and selling antiques. And do you still have that wing chair? No, I do not. <laughs> that wing chair ended up at a beach house. And one of my friends, and, and you know, when you're 19, you kind of like just figure, okay, let me see what we can do. We want to hold on to it, but we don't want to, you know, go ahead and create problems with the dorm. I took it out of the dorm with the help of a friend who at the time was the only one that had a car, took it to this beach house where these two young gentlemen lived and they lived to regret that. Shortly after that, we had a stealth-styled psychic involved and she ran a seance of all things. And Shannon, let me tell you, I will never ever participate in a seance ever again after this encounter. So I do not own the wing chair anymore. It ended up along the shoreline, just a few yards from the beach. Oh, gosh. That's how bad it got, huh? And the tide won't even take it away, oh my which goodness. is the worst part. <laughs> did you, just so folks know, you know, what's, what's in the book, did, is the reason that you won't participate in a seance anymore also included in the book? Uh, yeah, that was the one and only. 
<laughs> you're like one and done. Uh, no more seances for Anna. No, thank you. Now, uh, one more question about that chair. How soon after you yeah. bought it and put it in your dorm room, how soon after did things start to happen? I would say within a couple of nights. Wow. Um, I, I was really, you, you know, I, I didn't think anything of it. I didn't feel anything. And this is how naive I was. It, when I bought it, it was in daylight. It was sitting out amongst all these other things. You know, a flea market is open air. No one said anything to me about its background. I just fell in love with the fact that it it looked near perfect, but it looked very old. There was no tear in the fabric. And I fell in love with the pattern of the fabric. And I thought, oh, this will give us a little bit more ambiance than the usual kind of furniture you see in a dorm room. And so we took it away. We threw it on top of the beetle and off we went. And then the next thing you know, the room advisor was waiting for me at the curb as I was coming back. And there was a couple of girls there. Um, they looked very distraught, I would say. Uh, and, and the first thing that came to the room advisor's mind, I guess, because she asked me is, did you have people sign in into the guest book? And, you know, Shannon, I was totally floored. I said, no, I don't have a guest. You don't have your sister here. No. You don't have anyone visiting. No. Well, there's someone in your room. So, of course, I went upstairs, you know, and I had a retinue of people now, uh, you know, some in just wearing dungarees or whatever they're wearing at 11 o'clock at night. And they're following me into the room. And there was nothing in the room except for the chair, you know, my dresser and everything else. Everything was the same. But it went from there. It was almost like it got to the point. I was working part time at a hospital. And of all things, it was a mental health hospital. <laughs> and I actually preferred to stay and work the overnight shift because I started dreading going back. Because I then started getting feelings about this chair. And there were some things that I won't give it away, but there were some things that were now happening in the room. Mm. that told me I was not alone. Yeah, I don't blame you. I would I would suddenly enjoy the night shifts as well, <laughs> which would not be a normal thing for me. But yeah, gosh. Well, no. yeah, and in case anyone hasn't noticed, over the course of the books that Anna has released so far, there's obviously a lot of stories in here. And that's really astonishing, Anna, that that is you in the beginning of Portal. That was... Uh, that's some breaking news across my gray matter. That is really stunning to me. So, um, wow. Uh, so yeah, yes, it took a lot of years. I, well, and I can understand the need for the anonymity. Well, Anna, let everybody know where to find you plug any of the social media outlets that you need to. And of course, where to find the books. Okay. Um, I do have a website uh, and there's a direct link to purchase uh, into Amazon. The website is com. Of course, they can also find me on Amazon. And I also wanted to mention, I do have a full length memoir book. Uh, and as I mentioned before earlier um, during the show, people fall literally into my lap with these stories. This woman, she was 90 years old at the time, literally fell into my lap at an evening party dinner. And I, that's how I got to know her. She was trying to sit on the chair next to me. <laughs> and what <laughs> resulted from that was several uh, a series of phone calls. Uh, Krista, she's wonderful. Um, she passed away two months ago. Uh, but she gave me the information for a wonderful memoir called The Way Through the Woods. When she was 13 years old, she escaped through the Bavarian forest as a Nazi youth who defected, trying to find the rest of her family. And in that process, it was all the encounters in the woods that confronted her and also her father, as a matter of fact. So that was the second book coming out. And the third one was Haunted Heirlooms. Um, I also, going back to your question, since I tend to be tangential, can be found on Facebook. I also have a storytelling podcast called The Sinister Archives, 
Uh, sometimes I read excerpts of my books there, and sometimes I just tell stories that come across my way that could be fodder for the next compilation uh, of stories. Well, Anna, it's been a pleasure to finally have you on the show, and I hope to have you back once the next book comes out. Thanks so much for having me. It was a 